All right. Um, so we're live, right? <laughs> All right. Hello, everybody. Uh, if you are out there tuning in, thanks for joining us this evening. Um, I have my awesome uh, co-moderator here with me, Taiki James, Government Affairs Coordinator with the National Audubon Society, and special guest, John C. Robinson. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. So I uh, just want to give a uh, special thanks to um, the American Birding Association for hosting us and getting this going. It was a very short notice. Uh, but we were able to put it all together uh, so we can have an awesome conversation this evening. I'm looking forward to it. I have my awesome uh, shirt on from Cleveland that I got when I met with David Lindo um, last year. And I always have my flower ready, nice and pretty, mm -hmm. ready to go. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, shout out to all my environmental educator friends, family, uh, birders, black birders. Uh, and the Black AF and STEM group, if you are watching as well. Um, so we're going to get started. I'm going to introduce John here, uh, and then we'll ask some questions uh, to our special guest. Uh, Taiki will be monitoring uh, the questions in the chat, so feel free to put any questions there. And he, uh, I believe, will also be sharing some information um, if anybody is interested in wanting to know more or getting resources. Um, on John's work. So, all right, let's get started here. Okay, so a professional ornithologist, keynote speaker, and environmental consultant, John C. Robinson holds a Bachelor of Science degree in biology from Iowa State University, a two-time first uh, number one bestseller author. He has published six books about nature and birds, including an annotated checklist of the birds of Tennessee and the North American Bird Reference book. He has also led professional birding and natural history tours uh, to exotic and picturesque locations in Tennessee, Southeast Arizona, Upper uh, Texas Coast, and South Africa. Uh, for over 25 years, John worked as an ornithologist ornithological biologist uh, for two important conservation agencies, uh, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and the U.S. Department of Agriculture's Forest Service. Since 1999, John has been an advocate for minorities and bird watching in nature and has conducted research on how to connect our youth and young adults to nature through the magic of bird watching. He has worked in collaboration with Toyota and the National Audubon Society and continues to travel across country speaking about his most recent book, Birding for Everyone, Encouraging People of Color to Become Bird Watchers. As a financial advisor, John routinely works with philanthropists across North America <clears throat> to spread the message that birds and nature are for everyone to experience and enjoy. So welcome, John. Well, thank you I'm very so much. I'm so very excited to have you here. This is awesome. Thank you very much. And thank you for that introduction. Yeah, so let's get started with our, our first uh, question of the evening. Sorry, just making sure I'm like looking at the right. All right, so when and where did your journey uh, to become an ornithologist begin? Okay, that is one of the most frequently asked questions that I get, and it always takes me back to the sixth grade. When I was in sixth grade, I had a library teacher who noticed I didn't read any books. And she came over to me and she asked me, we have all these books in this library, how come you don't read them? And I told her, I'm not interested in any of these books. And she got a smile on her face, you know, the kind of smile that adults get when they've already figured you out. <laughs> so she went over to the bookshelf and she got a book. It was Jack London's Call of the Wild and she handed it to me. And she said, here, read this. And I came back a few days later, I was so excited. I read the book, I loved it. And I said, do you have any more like this? And she got that smile again because she knew she had me at that point. So she gave me another book um, called White Fang, which was the companion book from Jack London. And I read that. And in the sixth grade, I created this vision 
that when I grew up, I was going to be a biologist. I was going to study wolves and I was going to go live in Alaska. Well, I, I wound up being a biologist. I wound up studying birds. I didn't live in Alaska, but it was close enough. That was my goal and vision from the sixth grade. So did you have a spark bird? Growing up. Um, the, the, not growing up. The um, the transition from going from um, wanting to study wolves and going to actually study birds actually happened in my sophomore year in college. So I was already in college, already earning my degree when someone, my advisor told me that I had to take this class called ornithology. I didn't even know what the word meant. And I was like, what is that? And he said, it's the study of birds. And I was like, oh, I don't want to do that. I just want to study wolves. He says, I know. But if you want to graduate, you got to take this class. So I signed up for it. And uh, everything changed. I mean, literally, the first lecture, the uh, ornithology teacher walked in and, and basically said, you know, there's over... Um, over almost 9,000 birds that exist in the world. And I was like, well, I only know five of them. Where are all the others that, that are out there? I've never seen them. So my curiosity just increased exponentially from that point on. I would say that uh, in the first week of the course, when I saw a rufous sided tohi and learned that its song goes, drink your tea, that was my spark bird. Oh, those bows are awesome. I love that call. It right. takes me back to when I did my internship and early, early mornings, we would go out and do our nest searching and, and veg plots. Uh, and I, that was be a distinct song I would hear is the drink your tea mm -hmm. um, while we were out in the field. And sometimes it would just be part of it. It wouldn't be the whole thing. It would be the drink your. Right. And then I would wait to see if it would finish, but sometimes it wouldn't, but I just thought that was the most mm -hmm. awesome. <laughs> it's also a good reminder to stay hydrated. You know, if you're out <laughs> in the field and you're running, around, you know, like you at least have something to tell you, hey, stay hydrated. Right. You know, or I don't know if that's how, but you mm -hmm. know, you get the point. You get the point. All right. Do you want to uh, move on uh, to any questions, Taiki? If not, I can. You know, I don't here. have any questions yet in the comments, but I do mm -hmm. want to take this opportunity to welcome them and give a shout out to top fan Nathaniel Sharp, who says uh, those are their two favorite books and they wouldn't have discovered them without their school librarians. So shout out to school librarians, shout out mm -hmm. to reading, and thank you for the comment, Nathaniel. Let's get some questions in here. But Well, let me, let, let me go back. Uh, that was from Nathaniel. Nathaniel Sharp, yes. Yeah, yeah. Let me go back and talk about that uh, because uh, a lot of times when I'm speaking, I, I talk about 120 seconds, <laughs> and and I try to get people to relate. You know what what has happened in, in your life in 120 seconds that you can remember, and a lot of people can come up with certain things. For me, it's that story I told you about mm -hmm. when that sixth grade teacher came to me, and said, "Why aren't you reading any books?" here, read this, and she gave me Jack London's Call of the Wild, that whole conversation was 120 seconds. Mm -hmm. And as an adult, I can go back to that one event in my life, and I can say that one single event where an adult took an interest in me for just two minutes changed the trajectory of my life forever. And so I think as as teachers or environmental educators, we have to remember that it's, it doesn't have to be hours and hours. It can be just one event like that and it can make all the difference in the world. So anytime we have an opportunity to be in front of a youth or a young adult who's interested in nature and the outdoors, that's an opportunity for us to stand up and do what, do what we can to foster and generate that interest even more. So you have um, you mentioned in the your bio um, introduction that you've written six uh, books. Um, what sparked your interest to start writing? Ah, 
that sixth grade teacher. <laughs> no, I, I literally, once I started reading books and, and she gave me the first two to read, I just wanted to start reading more and more and more. And eventually I became interested in writing them. And I can even remember in the ninth grade, I started writing um, stories to appear in the high school magazine. And uh, a lot of the people would come up to me and tell me how they, they liked my stories. And so I've always had a creative nature inside of me and that's how it manifested was uh, through the written word. Some people are good at drawing art. I'm not, but um, I'm just as good at writing things as some people are good at drawing things. So that's where it started. Did you did you have any nature influences growing up? Uh, yes. Uh, basically, I would hang out in the backyard chasing spiders and crawfish um, and uh, uh, all kinds of stuff that were out there. <laughs> all, all of the butterflies. I used to build Lego bricks. I would build a house of Lego bricks that would have a window in it. And then I'd go out and I'd catch a spider and stick it in there. My mother was like looking at me with like shock and awe on her face. And then I, I'd wait a day and then the spider would, would have built a spider web. And then the next day I went out and I found a tiny little ant. And I would bring that in, open the top of the Lego house and drop the ant in there. And then I would watch through the window as the spider would um, come out and grab the ant. So th th this was my... Uh, five-year-old mind looking at how do we create a scientific experiment <laughs> so so yeah it started very very young oh wow I mean I think it's kind of incredible that spiders would run away from you because I think it, it's it's the <laughs> testament that you've done that enough times before that the right. other spiders are telling the other spiders <laughs> if you see him coming around he's going to put you in a weird colorful house and throw an ant in there and yeah. then you have to talk to this ant and be roommates. Nobody know who's paying rent. Nobody know how you're going to split up the bills because the ant comes. Well, not just the ant, but the whole colony. And it's it's a whole. I could only imagine the 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 issues that you may cause in the arachnid community. But <laughs> I do want to ask, what is your favorite bird? And this comes from uh, at Sasha underscore Melanated. She wants to know, as I do, what is your favorite bird? Um, well, my spark bird, as I said, was the. Um, Rufus sided towhee. My favorite bird, however, is an obscure little thing called a Louisiana water thrush. Mm. Now, if you're if you're in the east and you live near a rock bottom stream, uh, this is a bird you're going to see in April or May, and uh, um, it has a really beautiful song. But um, I was in my I'm going to say my second year of bird watching. And I was, um, I think, a junior, a, a junior in college. And I was taking a botany class. And the botany class went out to this state park outside of uh, Ames, Iowa, where I was going to school. We were out there to study trees. And I got into this area to start looking at the trees. And this bird came in. And it, it, it bobbed up and down and it sang this beautiful song and then it darted away. And of course, I went dashing up the creek to go get it, you know, to try to figure out what it was. And the, and the instructor is saying, John, get back here. This is a botany class, you know. <laughs> so I couldn't go and find out what the bird was. Um, so then we drove all the way back to campus. I got on a bicycle, I didn't have a car back then, and I, I rode my bike for 10 miles back out to the state park and went back to that stream and started going up further and I found this bird. And I had my bird book with me and I opened it up and started keying it out and I came to the conclusion, Louisiana water thrush. So I submitted that at the end of the spring to the um, record keepers for the state of Iowa. And I get this phone call uh, from the editor of Iowa Bird Life. And he's questioning me on this Louisiana water thrush. Wow. He, he wants to know, that, did you really see this bird? I mean, did you get a good look at it? And I described it and everything else. And 
finally he said, well, sounds like a Louisiana water thrush. And I, I said, well, why, why were you asking about this? And it turns out that was the earliest spring date ever recorded in the state of Iowa at the time. That's so awesome. what did I do? Next year, I went out one day earlier and got the second earliest oh, spring what? date. <laughs> John, you're wild. So, you're right. so 1980 and 1981, I had the two earliest. So check the receipts. Date. Look yeah. at the receipts. Right. Oh, wow, John, you had to do it to him. Right. Tell yeah. us the truth. Tell us the truth, though. Did you go back the third year and do it a day earlier? No, oh, no okay. I didn't get a chance that third. That third year, I was graduating, so I had other things uh, on my mind. So <laughs> I guess <laughs> that is awesome. I love see this. This is the the part that I enjoy the most too is just the story telling of these experiences and how they um, kind of connect to, to each of us in its its own way. Um, so you this this awesome book that you wrote, Birding uh, for Everyone, is kind of. Um, thinking more about youth and, and connecting youth to these opportunities of mentors around bird watching um, and getting them interested and engaged. What was the um, interest in, in you creating uh, the book Birding for Everyone? Oh, okay. Well, I was actually sitting in a little tiny town called Kernville. That's K-E-R-N-V-I-L-L-E, -L -L -E, Kernville, uh, California. And it was 1999. I had just published uh, the North American Bird Reference book and my first and only science fiction book at the time. <clears throat> and uh, I was just thinking about what could I do differently here? I mean, I, I, I'm still interested in writing. I want to do something else. And I was sitting in this little hotel room and asking myself, what could I work on next? And one thing came to mind. Um, and I, I was still employed by the federal government at, at that time. And as a career employee with the federal government, I got to move around the country to various states. And one thing that I remembered um, repeatedly as I went from one state to the next state to the next state is usually the first times I would go out bird watching, all the other local birders would come running up to me and go, oh my gosh, I've never seen a black bird watcher before. Cool. And it's not like I was watching blackbirds. <laughs> so um, I was just like thinking, okay, why does this keep happening to me? And so I just decided to research that a little bit. And I started with myself and I suddenly realized I haven't seen a lot of blackbird watchers either. So there might be something here. Um, one thing I can tell you is that I had already been experienced with publishing books. I had already done three on my own. When I first declared that I was going to write a book about this, um, I had people throwing money at me uh, and, you know, partners in flight, the Forest Service, the Fish and Wildlife Service. I had Toyota throwing money at me. And that's okay. never, that's never happened in any book before or since. And just the idea that so many people want and, and organizations wanted this book written and to get out there told me I have something here that, that people need and want and they're, they're very interested. And uh, so that gave me a lot of enjoyment and motivation to finish that project. That's so um, interesting, yeah, to, to know that you have that much and people don't want to outright ask, like, yeah, this is something I've always wondered about. <laughs> and then <laughs> someone comes up with, you know, this idea to, to create something uh, from it and get that backing. And I think you yourself kind of realize, huh, <laughs> uh -huh <that's laughs> this right. is definitely something that needs to be done. And, and you, I don't even, you, you, I'm pretty sure you didn't, um, weren't expecting too much from it. I think is that, would that no, be true? No, I wasn't expecting anything from it. I just mm. thought it was just a little exploration and it was just a little project that I was going to do. Um, and uh, it just started mushrooming and growing, growing uh, without me doing a whole lot with it. It was just once I got the word out that this is what I was working on, it, it, it attracted a lot of attention. And the more attention it attracted, the more excited I became with it because I suddenly realized, well, here's another way that I can help a lot of people. 
And, and it goes back to when I was in high school. I just, I'd like to create things that people can enjoy and read. And this became that next project for, for me. So how long did it take to finish? Um, started in 1999. The book was published in 2008. So it was about uh, nine years. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Is yeah. that, is that, give us a scale because nine yeah. years just sounds long for, I don't know, <laughs> baking a cake, but is making a book like baking, a, uh, that's not the question, is nine years, how does that scale? I've seen people write a book in as little as two weeks. I've seen people write a book in as little as two months, two years. It, it's, it's all relative, but this book needed a long uh, uh, gestation period, so to speak because there was a lot of things that we wanted to get right. There were peer reviewed studies that we wanted to get in there. And those took time to set it up and to get it done. Um, so um, yeah, that, that is uh, typical for a book that, that has a lot of staying power. Right. And by that, I mean, people are still buying the book today. It's 12 years old now, and people are still buying it monthly. So um, that you, you typically only see that for books that were really well thought out and well prepared. And just for, you know, the sake of plugs, where people probably have been buying those books, uh, where they're available at uh, buteobooks.com or Amazon or Google Books. Right. Got to throw that plug in, you know. Gotta yeah. Plug that. The, now, when you go to Amazon, if you're a, a dinosaur like me, you might want to have the, the paper version and you can buy the paperback book at Amazon. But there's also a Kindle version for those people who like to snuggle up next to their Kindle and read it. So you have two options there. How much would you say, I guess, percentage wise is research versus you and your story within the book? Ah, <laughs> never Since been asked that question years. before. Yeah, <laughs> I would say, yeah, I mean, the first chapter is really a lot me. And then I think it was chapter four where I, I, I can't remember if it was actually chapter four, but I talk about my experiences in Beckley, West Virginia. There's a great chapter there for those of you who have not read the book yet. Uh, but there are certainly parts of the book that are all about me and came from my own personal experiences. I, I would say 35 to 60 percent of that book was shaped by things that happened to me. But in the middle of the book, you'll see that I actually interviewed other ethnic minorities who were also uh, successful in finding a path to nature and the study of birds and the outdoors. So. All right. Do you have any questions uh, on your end, Taiki? Uh, yes, we do. Um, but since you've been talking about the book and the publishing, I, I want to just mm -hmm. stay there unless you want to pivot somewhere else. So oh, no, that's your let's call. keep going with that. So, okay. Um, Here's a question, a philosophical question from mm -hmm. one of my most philosophical friends in philosophical Philadelphia, Matt Haley. He asked, what lessons have birds taught you about yourself? Okay. And just to, just to throw some kindling in the fire, I grew up in <laughs> Pittsburgh on the other end of the state. So Philadelphia and Pittsburgh, they're always at it. <laughs> we don't have to talk about it, man. Let's be peaceful here, not in front of the people. <laughs> okay. Not in front of All America. Right. Let's keep our battle Turn in it the down. Commonwealth. Turn it down. Yeah, let's keep our battle in the Commonwealth. Yeah, right. This is neutral territory for both of us. Yeah. So birds, uh, what it has done is... Uh, it really has created a, a, a great sense of, it's brought me a great sense of calmness. I, I have a great sense of calm in the way I lead my life. And I think that's because I spend a lot of time out in nature. Uh, the other thing that I've seen is that I'm more in tune, more in touch with the changing seasons. So as it goes from spring to summer to fall to winter, I'm, all, I'm always looking at what's happening out in the environment. And a lot of the answers you'll find are the type of birds that you see out there. Um, but it can go in even further. If you're someone who likes to do your own lawn um, and or grow your own garden, uh, now the products that you buy to control weeds or, 
or things like that, or maybe the, the shrubs or the trees that, if, if that you buy are all gonna be influenced by your love of birds and the outdoors. Um, I find a lot of people who are, who are students of nature are gonna look for the, if I can get something that is organic as, as a way to help me have a better looking lawn, wouldn't that be better than putting out these really dangerous pesticides out there that do the same thing? And so um, I, I think that, uh, that I'm, I'm very influenced by a lot of those things that are, that are happening around me directly as a result of my love of nature and birds. So you've done a lot of traveling um, after, right, with uh, creating this Birding for Everyone book and have been across uh, the United States and the world, um, where, is, where did you, or did you have any memorable moments that um, influenced the writing of this book uh, from your travels? Um, one of the most memorable moments was actually in West Virginia. And I talk about that in the uh, book. Um, the, the other one was, uh, uh, just it's a it's a it's a combination of all the places that I've been and, and seen, um, but um, that time in Beckley, West Virginia, when I was out there, just so people kind of get an idea of what that was all about, <clears throat> I had to go on a four week um, training session. So with the federal government at the time, and so I was going to be gone for four weeks. I was going to be staying at this secluded area in Beckley, West Virginia. And um, it was the month of April, 1983, if I remember. And so I called up somebody there who was a compiler for the Christmas bird counts before I left Illinois where I was stationed and just said, hey, I'm gonna be in your area in April, can we go bird watching? And he said, sure, just give me a call when you're ready. So I went to West Virginia, um, I, I'd been there for three and a half weeks. Uh, we were getting close to the final week and I called him up, reminded him who I was. He said, oh yeah, let's go birding uh, this weekend. And I drove out there. Um, <clears throat> and uh, when I got to his house, that was kind of, just as I was driving up to his house, that's when I realized I had forgotten to tell him what I looked like. <laughs> so, and he was expecting someone who looked like most of the other birders in West Virginia. So you could just see his jaw just like that. And uh, I was like, um, a little bit awkward situation there, but uh, we spent three hours together. And in those three hours, we really bonded. We really became great friends. And we, we found out that we, uh, just had this super love for birds and nature and the outdoors. And I was able to locate him um, when I was writing the book. And he, he actually helped me write that chapter. And at the end of the chapter, he gave me something that I had never been aware of. There was something that happened after I left the state. And I'm, it, it's a secret. I'm not going to tell it here, but it's in the book. So, okay. And I was just totally impressed. So that secret made it into the book as well. It's like the uh, final uh, paragraphs on, on that chapter. Well, more reason to read the book if you haven't already. <laughs> that is awesome. I love it. Okay. Leaving some mystery there. Mm -hmm. uh, so a uh, birding question that I have, um, what's the, the, strangest or weirdest bird you've encountered in your lifetime? Ooh, um, there's probably two of them. One is a bird from South Africa. And uh, actually it's, it, it's found in more places than just South Africa. But uh, when I took a, um, a trip there, I certainly wanted to see it. And it's called a hammer cop. Have you ever heard of it? No. Okay, let me see if I can pull it up, uh, an image here of what it looks like. There we go. So I'm gonna try to share my screen here so you can see it. Okay. All right, do you see that? 
Yes. All right. This is a bird oh, that wow. is called the hammercop. And uh, this is a very unusual bird. There's a lot of myths and legends uh, focused around this bird. And when I took a, uh, when I led a bird watching and natural history tour to South Africa, this was my number one bird that I wanted to see was the hammer cop. And I actually wound up seeing quite a few. They're, they're actually quite common down there. Mm -hmm. um, the other one, the, I, I said there were two of them. The, the other one was um, a snowy owl. Uh, and I mean, snowy owls are snowy owls, right? Yeah. But I, I lived in Tennessee. And I remember um, uh, it was January 1987. And I was doing a waterfowl survey on a National Wildlife Refuge, which borders this river in Tennessee. So I had to cross this bridge that spans over the river. And as I was crossing the bridge, I saw this big white bird coming towards me. And I said, oh, must be an albino hawk. <laughs> and then as it got closer, I said, no, maybe it's a, a gall or something. And then as I got closer yet, I realized it had this typical cigar shape that you only see in owls, right? And that was right about the time when we were crossing paths. And I looked that way, he looked at me and I said, oh my gosh, it's a snowy owl. <laughs> and so I got down to the other, to the base of the bridge. I turned around and came back hoping I could find it. And the darn thing had landed right on top of the bridge. And when I stopped my vehicle, I was like, 30 feet away from it. So I radioed it into the refuge where I worked to my supervisor. She, she got excited and uh, it stayed around for about three weeks. I had all these bird watchers from uh, Georgia, from Kentucky, Mississippi, all coming and people were buying me dinner, buying me lunch, buying me breakfast and they were all going to look at this bird. Turns out, um, that was uh, 26 years had elapsed since the previous last known snowy owl in the state of Tennessee. So that bird was uh, the first one that had been seen in the state for 26 years. So that How was- How are you having well, all these bird moments? I love it. <laughs> yeah, that was That exciting. was fantastic. Right. <laughs> how do you keep ending up at the right moment, at the right, how do you, what is that? I don't know that's the real question, but <laughs> What's your secret, man? Uh, uh, it's just, it's going the extra mile. Um, hmm. Most people, most people will go out and then if they didn't see anything for a half hour, they'll just turn around and go, go back home. I'm, I'm willing to walk that extra half hour uh, just, just to see if well, there's something yeah. around the, the next bend in the curve, you know? You seem to be very much rewarded in your birding journeys, but what would you say is the rarest bird you've ever seen? Um, fork-tailed flycatcher. I, I had a fork-tailed flycatcher in California. It, it, it was on the rare bird list. Um, and I went out and saw that. And then um, we also had a bristle, th bristle thighed curlew that showed up um on the mm. west coast and uh i was it was about an hour away from my house and that at, at that time it was one of the first lower 48 sightings so those would be two of the rarest that i've seen nice you just had those off the top of your head i wanted to say again that question came from sasha at sasha underscore melanated thank you for the question okay this yes. is so cool i i'm really enjoying this um <laughs> All right. Me too. I'm loving your story so much. Um, so I want to move forward with just a little bit more about um, the work that you've been doing and, and what that means and how it's impacted um, communities that you've worked with and, and especially youth. Um, so that's a big part of some of the writing in your book is, is speaking to mentorship and um, kind of helping them navigate and find their way and um, building their confidence with uh, bird watching, um, in terms of connecting to youth and, and continuing your writing, but also the engagement component with the bird watching, is there anything specific um, that stands out to you that is like, okay, this is definitely one of the things that really gets youth in, invested in bird watching? 
Yeah, the, um, the one thing that really stands out, I think, is this topic or this idea that I, that I speak about a lot called permission. And this, this idea that a lot of times when we're working with inner city and minority youth or young adults, sometimes they feel like they, they need permission to, to do what many of us take for granted. So let me share my screen here and I'll kind of go over that a little bit. Um, this is uh, from one of the talks I gave a while back. And you know this idea of let's go birding, well, we're all familiar with that because we do it every day. Um, but when I first got started, I was a uh, college student in the state of Iowa. So demographics are very different in Iowa, say, than from inner city Philadelphia. So in Iowa, I was talking with my friends and I was asking, what is bird watching all about? And they basically said, well, you're going to take these. You're going to walk around the neighborhood with all these beautiful homes. And you're going to look for these. <laughs> and they made it sound so <laughs> simple. But as I was internalizing this as a young 20-year-old um, African-American male, I was hearing, you mean you want me to walk around with these binoculars around all these beautiful homes and you want me to look in people's backyards? And that was scary. That was truly scary. And part of it was, I didn't see anyone looking who looked like me doing this. And I felt like I needed permission to do that mm -hmm. because I knew that if people saw me doing that, they would be thinking something else about me. And so the first couple of years, I used to walk around with my binoculars hidden underneath my jacket and so forth. I didn't want anybody to know that I carried them around. And uh, I was very self-conscious about it. And a large part of this has to do with um, when, when, when you're, when, when you're be being exposed to this, if you don't see other people who look like you, it, it makes it very difficult now to make that decision that it's just okay to go out there and do that. And so something as simple as this and, and hearing the way that they told me the, what it was, but then listening to how I was internalizing that and seeing it from a completely different perspective, um, that is uh, one of the biggest things that, that I had to con contend with out there. And so this idea of permission, um, the way that we address that is we normalize it. And so if you're an environmental educator and you have the opportunity to work with an inner city youth, uh, maybe someone who's afraid to go out camping or go up to the Sierra Nevada to um, look at uh, some of the alpine birds up there. Just go ahead and take that first outing with them, you know, take them camping. Um, there's going to be a lot of fear in them at first, but then you do it again a second time and maybe even a third time. And then eventually that child is going to be asking you to take them out there because suddenly they know they they realize they no longer need permission to do it they they just want to go and um and so by normalizing it it's this it's this repeated exposure over and over and i that that's definitely sits with me um i've been in some of those situations where i've been with um white friends and have gone places with them and it's for them it's just like hey, let's go explore this nature space, you know, where I grew up, this will be awesome. And I'm like, no, <laughs> I don't know where I am. This is weird. I'm scared. And I don't, you know, bring any of that emotion out. I think it's just more of knowing I have to be even more careful in those situations. And yes, they're my friend. I've, I've known them for a long time and we hang out and do things all the time. But at the same, um, in the same breath, just knowing that history with going into places you don't feel um, you belong in or there's no sense of ownership, um, that can be very jarring. So yeah, you, you speaking to that, um, of just that casualness of, you know, yeah, you're just gonna go out and burn watch and it's just like, do you see me? <laughs> so <laughs> I think, yeah, I think it's, it's interesting. And even building up to like, I, I feel like it's very intergenerational too, that fear and that burden of 
you know, we're, we're in these spaces um, together and, and we're experiencing things in these different ways, but that um, it's, it's the same, that same feeling in those situations that you feel um, with, within in those different uh, generations. So I, I think that's really interesting just to kind of see like where, where their head is versus where your head is. And like, it's, it's so much more heavy uh, for you as, as a person, um, a black man, who's just like interest, there's interest there, but at the same time, it's, there's this barrier, um, internal barrier that's being created. Yeah, that's a great, great point. And I think it took me several years to kind of push my way through that cycle. Uh, then once I got on the other side, it, it basically literally all changed. Um, but, uh, and it's just that repeated exposure over and over. Were there any, um, it's growing up in, in your neighborhood or even as you got older and, and went on to college and um, got your degrees, uh, people that you connected with and shared more of that birding experience with over time? Because I know you, you mentioned like you were kind of hiding it and didn't want to reveal that uh, right <laughs> away. But did that expand into, you know, this is something I'm really enjoying and, and want to share with others? Yes, uh, it actually started almost immediately. Um, I would say I started bird watching around March, February, March 1979. I, I know that by that fall, um, I was already being uh, approached by local Audubon chapters to come speak to their um, meetings and so forth. And in the winter of um, 1979 to 1980, my ornithology teacher came back to me. He had been kind of watching me from afar and he had seen what I was doing. He was noticing that every day between classes on campus, I was looking at birds. Um, he approached me and asked if I wanted to be a um, TA, a teacher's assistant for the ornithology class that next spring. And I said, absolutely. Now TAs were usually reserved for graduate students. Um, so it was very unusual to see an undergraduate student get that. But I did that for three years, 1980, 81, and 82. And that was just so exciting to be able to take the new class out and show them and share with them my enthusiasm for the birds. You are so fancy. I love it. <laughs> It's so cool how you, yeah, these opportunities, the, the exposure, I think is really cool too, of just being a part of something yeah. that technically wasn't supposed to happen and you're just getting even more um, exposed to these opportunities around bird watching and, and just these different networks and, and communities. Well, watch it because Ty Key is going to ask me again, how did you wind up being at the right place at the right time? <laughs> it just, I don't know, man. I'm starting to detect a pattern here. I don't know, but, right. you know, maybe you're just excellent. I mean, maybe I should just accept that. You know, maybe we should just live in a society where a black man, a black woman, black people, black families, black community can be successful and we can be happy about it, right? We can raise yeah. the roof if we need to, all right? <laughs> like if we need to, we can do it. We don't always have to, but if we need to, yeah. we know we have that option. And it's because we stand on the soldier, shoulders of giants like you. Yes. You know, yeah, honestly, yes. if we're going to raise any roof, we know that we are, we got a good booster. Yes. Thank I, you. I appreciate that. Do we have any questions coming in from your end, Taiki? Well, you know what's great about what you two just discussed? It really answered a lot of questions that were coming into the chat about um, birding inclusivity, but I wonder if we can just dig a little deeper and if you could be uh, just so specific, maybe to something in your book that advises or provides guidance for creating inclusivity while you're in the field, while you're leading a bird walk or while you're on a bird walk or something like that. Yeah, so what I'll do is uh, just talk a little bit about um, some of the things that came as a result of doing all of the uh, speaking engagements and meeting with environmental educators across the nation. Um, the things that I talk about in the book, number one is needing permission. But beyond that, what we also have to realize, <clears throat> we, we have to 
get a message out there about uh, the need to get more people involved in nature and the outdoors. And the message starts at home. So we need a way that we can reach the parent, the parent of that child. We need a way that we can reach the teacher because when the children are not at home, they're in school. And when they're not at home or in school, they're somewhere in the local community. So we need a way to reach those local community centers where some of the kids might be hanging out. We also need a way to uh, get the word out um, through the communication method that is preferred by that community. So whether that's radio, magazines, TVs, um, and, and using the language that, that needs to be used. Uh, if you're in a Hispanic community, you really wanna make sure that you've got that message going out in English and Spanish at the same time. And then finally, role models and mentors. We need a lot more of those because we don't have enough and that's where the permission comes from. If you don't see people who look like you, um, it makes it very difficult to, to feel comfortable taking that first step out there. So many of these first six items were kind of discussed uh, as the book got rolled out and, they're, uh, and two through six are specifically mentioned in the book itself. Um, once the book was published, I began to meet with environmental educators. And one of the things that uh, I was able to get from going around the country and talking to a lot of people who are on the front line, trying to, trying to get this message into the community was mm -hmm. many of the people were, many of the educators, 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 educators were asking me, well, how can I spark the child's interest? You know, the common question was, 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 how can I, as a Caucasian environmental educator, go into a, a community where it's 90% Black or 90% Hispanic and speak to this child who's a different culture than I am and get that interest sparked? Mm -hmm. um, where do I find the funding to support the work that I do? And it's, it's not enough to just talk about it in the classroom or talk about it on the radio, but how can I actually get that child into nature? How can I actually get them there so that they can experience it firsthand? And, um, and then this, this last one, stepping into the unknown, um, this is a twofold problem. <laughs> um, a lot of the inner city kids that we meet, I remember meeting this uh, young black girl from Oakland, California. She was about 16 or 17. And we were doing a tree planting project with her. She was fearful of going camping in the Sierra Nevada. She'd never gone. And she had never even seen the ocean, even though she lived in Oakland, California, about 40 minutes away, never been there. So she had this inability to figure out how could I step into the unknown? Um, but we also see this in the environmental educators. Uh, some of the educators are trying to f figure out how do I put myself into the shoes of these kids who, mm -hmm. who have a different perspective on life and were raised in a different culture than I am. How can I do this, feel comfortable and gain the trust of these kids? So these were some of the challenges that um, were, were raised by the environmental educators as I, as I uh, moved across the country. And I, I think this really came out to be um, it evolved into a, a speech that I used to give, which was the top 10 ways to connect our youth to nature and the outdoors. Um, so further on with this, what I want to say is that um, this is something that um, just going up here to another mm -hmm. slide that I want to get. So this last slide here that I'm going to show, which I think is really crucial. Um, this is where we gave a self-evaluation quiz to many of the environmental educators that, me with, that we met with. The first question was, do you have a message that you get out there? Uh, do you think it's a consistent message to get people interested in the outdoors? And most mm -hmm. of the environmental ed educators gave themselves great marks. It usually averaged about an eight. But then 
as we started talking about, are you reaching parents of the inner city and the minority youth and young adults? Are you reaching the teachers, the community leaders? Are you using the appropriate media to connect with the kids that you're trying to reach? And are you specifically using role models? On a scale of one to 10, you can see what the average self-evaluation scores are. And this was a great wake up call for us because we could actually see if we could help environmental educators improve these scores so that they felt like they were doing better at reaching parents or using the right media or leveraging and engaging role models, we could make a big difference. So that was something else that came from the research um, as well. Wow, uh, Nicole, I have a really, really important question I would love yeah. to ask if that's okay. Um, yeah, this one it. comes from uh, someone that I know personally, someone that I technically grew up with, uh, my mom. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> she, yeah, mom. She, yeah, right. Thank you, mom. Um, she asks, uh, how, what intergenerational projects do you have planned to pass on your knowledge and love of birding, of bird watching to black youth or, or to the generations yet to come? Ah, okay. Thanks, mom. Yeah. All right, well, let's, uh, let's talk a little bit about that. Um, what I can say is that a lot of this work uh, in, the, um, in the book stemmed from when I was writing the book, I actually got to meet on the phone this man called Thomas Cleaver. Uh, he was a, a gardener and very interested in the outdoors down in San Antonio, Texas. And he uh, was in charge of a, of a center for at-risk youth. And one of the things that he wanted to do was teach these kids tennis, taekwondo, and bird watching. <laughs> so um, I actually sponsored him. Uh, I sponsored his organization for $1,000. And uh, that year, his kids entered a birding contest, and they actually took first place in the birding contest. So that was a lot of fun. Um, I never got to meet Thomas Cleaver in person because when I went back to him to get him to write his chapter for the book, um, I found out that he had um, accidentally passed away. And so I never got to really uh, meet him and, and do a lot of the work that I had planned to do with him. Uh, but his partner, uh, who he was working with, she she provided me access to a lot of the notes that he had done. And so with her help, I was able to still bring his story into the book, even though it wasn't written by him. It was basically informed by his business partner. Now, mm -hmm. one of the things that uh, I saw in the uh, tribute after he died um, was uh, one of the local bird watchers said, no man ever stands so tall as when he stoops to help a child. And I felt like if I could be even half as great as Thomas Cleaver, mm. I feel like maybe I can do something here, you know? Um, mm -hmm. Now, I had two encounters with his partner. Uh, one time I flew to Texas no, I, I flew to Arizona and um, I met her uh, and uh, she uh, recognized me in the air, airport. But another time I had gone down to San Antonio and while I was in San Antonio, I asked, hey, can I, can I come out and see some of the kids at the uh -huh. youth center? And she said, yeah, we've got a, a brand new crop of kids. You can come out and speak to them. And so these are the kids that I got to meet. It was around 2008 or 2009 when this picture was taken. These kids had never gone bird watching before until the day that mm. I took them out. Okay. And um, we went out. You can see the water in the background. We had some ducks sitting on the water. Um, oh, I, put, I put my spotting scope on it. And then I kind of knelt down and I was opening up my book. I felt like a quarterback in the Super Bowl. These kids were all around me. It was like I was doing my play call. I said, okay, this is what yeah. we're going to do. You're going to go out, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, they were just mm -hmm. following my every word because they wow. had never seen anyone who looked like me that could do these things. And they were all interested and wanted to learn how they could wow. do this them, themselves. 
Um, the other thing that I'll say is that um, there is a, uh, a youth program here in um, San Francisco that has a great approach to this. And it, I tried to um, follow it as much as I could when I was doing the Toyota partnership. Um, but what she does is she goes out into the third grade and works with third grade teachers to start getting the word out to inner city youth um, about nature and the outdoors. So she's working with the third grade teachers. And then the following year, um, she's going out to work with those same teachers, but now she's also going out and working with the fourth grade teachers, right? So she's following these kids that were in the third grade who are now in the fourth grade. She's working with them again. And she basically brings in all these uh, bird watching projects, these bird trips and everything else. And she's helping these kids learn about birds, nature and the outdoors. But it doesn't stop there. Fifth grade, what does she do? The same thing. But now it's on steroids. What she does in the fifth grade is she, she helps some of the kids in the fifth grade volunteer to become ambassadors for the new third graders coming into the program. So now you have these fifth grade kids who are now mentoring the third grade kids and you have the adults mentoring fifth, fourth and third grades. And that is a great way to run a program because now you have these repeated touches year after year after year and by making it persistent mm -hmm. you have a much greater likelihood that you can get these kids interested in the long run to study nature and the outdoors like scaffolding right yeah. mm. that was a great question i'm glad you asked it thanks techies mom you're awesome <laughs> <laughs> That was a wonderful question. And I was trying not to get emotional because that was uh, fantastic. Um, so again, if any if anybody hasn't gotten this book, please do, it's amazing. And I'm sure there's even more um, great stories and, and tips uh, to get you out there and uh, your community and connecting um, youth. So I have a question kind of tying to that, um, back to the mentorship and, and how important that is. Um, that is something that's very important to me, um, especially when I grew up and, and having 10 siblings, shout out to all my siblings, seven sisters and three brothers, um, and <laughs> being the one who is definitely like invested in mm. nature and like wanting to connect um, in, in different ways. Uh, but having a mentor, um, it, can you speak to that you don't have to know these specific things about nature or birds to be an awesome mentor? Yes, um, I think a lot of it is just going to come from the from the enthusiasm. Um, but the 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 opportunity that we have is recognizing that anyone that we meet, anyone that we have an encounter with, could go on to become much greater than me. And so um, every year when I get to meet a young kid, I'm, I have no idea where that encounter is going to lead. I, I'm sure when my sixth grade teacher gave me that book, she never envisioned that I would be doing all these things. Um, but that's the magic of how this works, 120 seconds. So it's, it's, it's really, um, it's really, allowing yourself to be seen as someone who um, can be trusted and can encourage that new person on the block to just keep going. Uh, think, of, think about it as a, every time that we get a message out to a, a third or a fourth grader. Uh -oh, I think we lost. John. I think he's just giving us the best form of suspense he could ever give us. It's like a little can and then that uh -huh. All right, you're back. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> can you can you can you hear me now? Yes. Froze right. there a little bit, but we're good. All right. Yeah. So I think what we have to remember is that anytime that we connect with youth, um, let's just say a third grader, when we have that first environmental ed moment with them 
we create a little flame. It's just like a little candle. And if we never come back to that person, that flame eventually dies out and then goes away. And so um, whatever we can do to keep that flame alive and to keep that person interested and to just keep encouraging them to go out and, and study nature in the outdoors and, and ask, what do you need? What help do you need? What are you afraid of? How can I help you? Um, those, are, those are all great, great questions. And uh, so whatever I can do to do that, that's what I try and do. I, I know I've passed along a lot of encouragement to people who have followed me over many, many years. And uh, I, I just hope that all the environmental educators have the opportunity to do that. Yeah. Sorry, my screen kind of <laughs> clicked off there for a second. That is awesome. I thank you so much for, for mentioning that because um, I, I have a lot, even um, with my environmental education background and working with youth um, in different ways, uh, I've been asked that a lot of, you know, how do I make an impact as an adult to youth um, interested in these things um, when I don't know anything about them? Uh, so I think you don't have to have this, you know, um, prestigious background uh, in, in birds or even nature um, to make a difference mm. in uh, a youth's life because, you know, we're all in those those moments of needing someone's support and, and love and, mm -hmm. um, mm. and the light that you mentioned, be the light. So if you can continue mm. doing that, you can help someone else shine. All right. So this is way back in 1982. Okay. This is my Lincoln Hayes moment from Mod Squad, if you remember Lincoln Hayes. Um, this is when great I had hair. Man, really great reference. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but 1982 is when I got my very first permanent job. I was working at Crab Orchard National Wildlife Refuge. Um, and this was at the start of my career. Um, wow. and I can't remember who took this photograph, but I never let it go. Um, I worked about nine years with the Fish and Wildlife Service and went on and worked the rest of my career with the Forest Service. Um, but, you know, one of the messages that I think came from the last couple of questions that we had is that each of us can do our part. And uh, kind of what that means is that in bird conservation, when more of us are each doing his or her part, we all contribute to the greater good. So, mm -hmm. do you know who said I that? I want to highlight that. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. Do you know who said that? Taiki? Uh, the Lorax? No, John Robinson. <laughs> oh, well, I mean, I'm close. I mean, I feel like both of you carry a legendary energy, you yeah. know? <laughs> also, I want to point out, I just want to point out that the picture. Is it was taken in 1982, so it didn't have to be in black and white, but it just it, it still looks like a really epic. It looks like just a really epic, like historical photo. I'm sure I'm going to see that in the Smithsonian uh, at some point, but right. you know, I just wanted to point that out. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Thank you. You are hilarious. <laughs> yeah. uh, do we have any other questions? Um, in the comments that we want to make sure we're not missing. So, Nicole, one thing that I get asked a lot uh, when I go out is, is why do we why do we try to make all the effort that we do to get this working? And um, one of the things that I found is when I initially started doing the research on this and, you know, this goes way back to 1999, 2000. So this is almost 20 years ago, <clears throat> was a lot of the population pundits that were out there at the time basically were projecting that around 2042, mm. the, ma the majority of the people who vote in the United States would come from different ethnic minority backgrounds. And so when we think about the places that we go to that go bird watching, Yosemite, Yellowstone, you know, just insert your own national or state park that you like to go to. A lot of us take those places for granted because they've always been here. But you have to remember the reason why they're here is because the voting public 
wanted them to be here. Um, and one of the challenges that we face is that um, we, we face the challenge of getting more ethnic minorities expressing a really strong interest in the outdoors and nature, you know, specifically visiting the national parks, visiting the national forests. And so when we, when we get to that stage, which is only gonna be like 22 years from now, if the majority of the voting public doesn't have a great expressed interest in nature and the outdoors, these places that we take for granted, well, they may not be there. Um, mm. Because who will they elect into office? They're going to elect into office people who reflect their own views. So if we can get more people to think about nature and these outdoor places as something that is desired and needed, um, something that can be there for their own children or grandchildren, then um, that's why we do this. That's why we work so hard to make this work. Yeah, and I, I think that's um, another um, key point is, you know, sometimes it's not even these birding experiences, but even thinking about our, the health of our communities in relation to um, the wildlife and, and plant life and things that we have in it and thinking about um, policies around clean water and clean air. And it's just as important uh, for us uh, living in these neighborhoods as it is for, for the wildlife. Excellent. My wife just made me a fruit drink here. See, this all goes back to what we were talking about. <laughs> <laughs> that looks yummy, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, Rook, and in terms of um, just thinking about studying ornithology, um, and this question can go for anybody who's interested in, in wanting to take that route or that path. Uh, but more so for the um, current uh, researchers out there, um, researchers of color, black researchers who are really wanting to get into this field and, and make an impact. Um, what recommendations would you give them to uh, keep pushing forward um, amongst all of the you know, things around uh, racism and, and white supremacy and just intolerance in, in these fields? Um, I would just say, create a vision in your mind that it will be there, that it's going to happen. It's almost like you're seeing yourself already in possession of your goal. And that's what I was able to do, not consciously, but that's what I was able to do in the sixth grade. I knew I was going to be a biologist. And so by the time I got to be 18 or 19, I just knew it was going to happen. Um, my parents didn't have the money to put me to college. I, they had nothing. And so I had to get good grades. That's one recommendation. With the good grades, I got scholarships. I applied for one scholarship after the another, after another. And so the scholarships largely funded my way through college. And then I even got a job at the local library there and, and, uh, worked my way through college as well so that I could pay for the ed education. And, um, and I was just, I, I was so motivated to get out and get a job. Um, I knew that I could stay in school and go for a master's or even a PhD. But once I got the bachelor's degree, I was motivated to go out and do what I could to make a difference. And, and that's what kept driving me to just keep uh, pushing forward. Um, I think that if you demonstrate those kind of skill sets, um, the, the discipline to, to study and get good grades, um, to support yourself and, and just having that drive in the belly that you want to make it, um, you'll, you'll make it, uh, but yeah, there's a lot of barriers out there and we, we could list a large number of them. But when you begin to shine like that, the people in the world that can make a difference and give you that leg up on the next ladder, they will see you, they will extend that hand down and they will pull you up and you just follow that their lead. And mm. um, so uh, that's, 
yeah, there's, um, you know, it's, it's, it's been said there are two types of people in the world. Um, those who see the cup half full and those who see the cup half empty. And I don't know when I created this attitude for myself, but it goes back for many, many, many years. And I think it must be in my teens or something. Um, I think I'm one of the third types in the world. I always see my cup overflowing. And so I've always had a positive outlook on life. I always feel like if, if, if I want something, I know I'm going to get it somehow. And so mm -hmm. I, I never approach it like, oh, there's all these obstacles. I'm never going to make it. I'm just, I'm always approaching it like it's going to be there. I'm going to make it. And so just move forward. Don't stop. Yes. I Thank love you for that. that. I love that. And again, be the light. I have light shining on me right now. So I need to move a little bit, but be the light. <laughs> right. <laughs> Thank you so much for that. I have a question here from the audience. Uh, a friend of mine, Dave Macbion, uh, he asked, have you personally noticed an increase of birders of color since your book has come out? Is it like a causation correlation situation here? What, what's your observations? Well, Taiki, Dave is my friend. Yeah, Dave. Oh, excuse me. <laughs> excuse me. <laughs> yeah, no, he and I go way back. Uh, yes, actually, yes. When I started this project in um, 1999, uh, mm -hmm. I could count the number of African American birders that I admit on one hand. And since the book has come out, um, yes, there has been a distinct increase in the number of all minorities taking up bird watching. And mm -hmm. um, I just, I don't feel that we've seen the full potential of what could have been there, but yes, there has been, there have been more who are out there now. And so uh, I, I feel satisfied that we have made some progress, but certainly it's not the full potential that we could have made over time. And I think they've always been out there. They just weren't presented with more opportunities to shine. Again, be the light. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, and it comes back to this don't loop that I talk a little bit about in the book. Mm -hmm. um, when you're growing up, if you're in an inner city community, a poor neighborhood, um, think about how people get started in bird watching. A lot of times it's because someone, usually some adult, that could be a teacher, a parent, someone in the local community, but someone introduces you to it, okay? But if you live in a poor neighborhood, um, you, you now no longer have the, the uh, wild bird centers or the um, wild, wild bird stores that are out there, right? Because a lot of times those stores are located all the way across town. You have many fewer bird, bird watchers who you could potentially cross paths with. So you don't get to meet a lot of other bird watchers. And if you don't get to meet a lot of other bird watchers, you don't realize that this is an activity that you can take an interest in. And if you don't realize this is an activity you can take an interest in, you don't do it. And that's called the don't loop. You're just stuck in that don't loop because you've never had the opportunity to meet someone who can introduce you to it so that you can do it. And that's another one of the challenges that we have is that the, the opportunities are, are much fewer out there, say in a neighborhood like where I grew up. I, I wanna add, maybe there's a, there's a third option, um, offer it as a job. My first job was an environmental educator where I was out watching birds. And only then did I realize it was a skill. And then only after that, that I realized it was a hobby for people. Yeah, that is, uh, you were in the right place at the right time. 
<laughs> Listen, and, and the program, and there are similar programs like that going on uh, that, that, you know, employ folks, uh, you know, in communities, in their parks to, you know, teach them about environmental education, to get them in uh, conservation, to get them to understand that there's ways that we can interpret this so that we can better understand what our solutions can be so that we don't have flooding on the streets in the same way. And so that, you know, it's not as hot in the summer because we know we can have trees to, to reduce the heat index in neighborhoods. I mean, but we also know that, you know, there were decisions made that said, hey, these folks are going to live over here. These folks are going to live over here. We know that there are decisions that have a history of being made that say we're going to put resources here and we're going to put the trash over here. And I think that that exists, too. I think want to add that as barriers in the, you know, uh, approach to birding, because it's just why would I go out and watch birds when, you know, most of the time I go to a park there's a cop at the end of the block that just stares me down, whether I'm going to go watch birds or not, you know, like I, I may not feel that safe or I may not feel like that activity will, will hit the top five reasons for me to go outside. Exactly. Yeah. Well, hopefully that answered Dave's question. I'm sure he's happy and I'm sure he's also super happy that you, <laughs> took his <laughs> took my friendship <laughs> i mean well, the thing about david small story i went to the um focus on diversity conference in mcallen texas where i got to bird with uh j drew uh dr j drew uh Lanham, and i saw a green jay mm -hmm. quick story you saw that <laughs> i i remember oh, you have another question yeah <laughs> techie i <laughs> I love you. Um, I, so uh, this is a bird question. Okay. Do you have a bird that is just like meh? Ooh. I don't want to give any energy, any thought. Ooh. <laughs> your cup bird. may run us over, but when you see <laughs> yeah. the bird, your cup stops running. Your cup just like, well, we're full. We're full. We're we're full yeah. here. We're we're good. Actually, there's no investment there from the heart of this yeah. bird. What, what is that for you? <laughs> um, I really don't know that I do because I kind of approach bird watching as every day will be different. And even though we can go out and see a Carolina chickadee in the in the Tennessee woods every single day, and, and after a while, one chickadee looks like another chickadee. One day you're going to go out and you're going to see this hawk flying through and the talons come out and grab something. And then when the hawk lands, you see that the hawk has a Carolina chickadee in its talons. And that's a different way of looking at a Carolina chickadee. And so um, I'm always looking for that new experience, that, that one thing that I haven't seen before. Now, that's a little bit of an extreme example. Mm -hmm. But uh, the uh, an another one that is not so graphic <laughs> would be um, <laughs> when I was uh, bird watching up in uh, northern Wisconsin on the mm -hmm. what they used to call the Shawamigan National Forest. I'm in the middle of a of a coniferous forest, walking along a trail, and up ahead I see a bird on the ground. This is in the fall, so it was during the fall mig migration. I mm -hmm. see this bird on the ground and it's got these uh, colors like red and brown and black or something. And I'm like, what kind of sparrow has these colors? And as I get closer, it's still there and I still see these colors and I'm trying to figure out what bird is this? And then finally, I said this was going to be less graphic. Yeah. So finally, <laughs> I, I get close enough and I look at the bird and it's a Lapland long spur. Now, <laughs> Not everybody knows what a Lapland long spur is, but typically a Lapland long spur is going to be found out in the middle of like a harvested cornfield where there's just miles and miles of bare land, <laughs> dirt, no trees. That's where you're going to find a Lapland long spur. And here I am in the middle of a coniferous forest on a wooded trail. And what I theorized mm. is that this bird was migrating. It turned light. You know, a lot of the songbirds migrate at night. And it just decided to come down and land in the first place that it could. And it just chose this oh. national forest. So I was just happened to be there when it did that. And, you know, <laughs> you know, I mean, Lapland long spurs, when you see them, they're in like flocks of two or three or 400. 
yeah. <laughs> you know, just like you've seen one, you've seen many of them. Well, there is a lap in Longsburg for me. I'll never forget. So I guess I'm, I'm, I'm always looking for that unique experience, Nicole. So mm. I really don't have a bird like that. <laughs> Man, that's, you are an incredible storyteller. <laughs> <laughs> I was really trying to imagine this bird to be a bird I've never even seen before. And I'm like, well, I've, I don't even know what this bird looks like. So I'm just going to have to look it up in the, in the Sidley or the Peterson or somebody. Yeah. But, but man, that's, that was an incredible story and a really good perspective about um, looking at birds and, and seeing birds, not just looking at them. Mm -hmm. I have a topical question for you. Yes. A topical meaning of the day. Mm -hmm. So, I know that there have been some talks and I've been hearing some conversations, a lot of stim a lot of them stemming from Wildlife Observer Network's blog on renaming the birds of North America. Um, I was wondering if, if you just have any initial thoughts just on that premise, renaming the birds of North America. Where does your mind go? What do you think? So you're talking about like whether we split one species into two or two species back into one or maybe change the name of a bird that used to be known to us as one thing to another name is that what you're talking about there yeah 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 not the dr manhattan thing i've just watched watchmen so yeah we're not trying to do matter changing and you know life on europa yet but okay. um yeah yeah renaming birds right so this is a perpetual problem that i think has always been there when I started studying birds in 1979, I was first introduced to it as a just a, a freshman uh, student to the topic of ornithology. <clears throat> because we were looking at our bird book and yet some of the names of birds at that time were different than what they were in the bird book. And what I learned was is that over time they just changed these names. You know, you, you look at the the white-tailed kite, for example. We, we get that bird out here in California. And for a while there, they changed the name to the black-shouldered kite. And then they changed it back to the white-tailed kite. <laughs> you know, so um, you, you just, it's just part of the territory. It comes with the territory. Um, and you just have to recognize that it, it, it's gonna happen. You, just kind of go with the flow. So I don't have any reservations on it. Um, it's, it's just part of what's there. I have another bird question. This is more like in relation to how people think about mm -hmm. birds that don't do birding or bird watching. Uh, what's, uh, what are some, or what is one misconception um, that you've, you've heard about birding? From people. About birds or the activity of bird watching? The activity of birding. Oh, okay. Um, that is a very, very interesting question. Um, I think that one of the misconceptions can be is that it can be very competitive. And some people actually make it that way. Um, but one of the things that I've always taught all of my students is try not to compete with other people when you're out bird watching. If there's one person that you need to compete with, make it yourself, you know? So, if, you know, if you, like, like me, if I went out and saw that Louisiana water thrush on April 2nd in 1980, why don't I go out and see if I can find it one day earlier the next year? And, mm -hmm. and um, I found that when you, when, you, when you make it more about the enjoyment of the activity versus always trying to be better than someone else who's mm. birding beside you, you, mm -hmm. you don't experience the burnout of trying to always be better than somebody else, but you experience that perpetual enjoyment of the activity again and again and again. Um, I think another misconception that is out there is that you know, maybe only only nerds do this. I've heard that a lot. <laughs> uh, but uh, you see all kinds of people go bird bird watching. It's just not, uh, you know, the the class intellectual. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So we have a little bit more time left, and I just wanted to um, ask. I actually want to ask two more questions. So the first one I'm going to ask. Um, 
is uh, just speaking to um, inclusivity again, going back to that topic and uh, just thinking about the organizations and associations um, themselves. And we talked about um, during your PowerPoint, you mentioned um, some of the barriers, some of the obstacles. And I wanted to know like the thinking about um, the investment in communities uh, to these resources, to these opportunities um, is something that needs to, uh, to be stepped like it's it's an opportunity to engage more with that within mm -hmm. these organizations and associations that um, it shouldn't just be put on our shoulders like as educators to, like write grants or you know provide the funding um, in that sense but but looking forward and thinking about um, how these organizations are set up in terms of really making it a priority to invest in more opportunities to engage. Um, with youth of color and, and communities of color. Uh, can you speak to the in, importance of that? I think it is important. And I know that I served on the board of directors for the American Birding Association. Um, and, uh, and part of doing that, uh, Jay, uh, Dr. Lanham was on the board with me uh, for uh, a couple years. So, um, I know that the American Birding Association really uh, tried to move in a, in a good direction with that. Um, and my other experience was with the uh, Outdoor Writers Association of America. Um, and uh, that was an organization that I uh, got involved with, went to a couple of their conferences. And um, we really saw an opportunity to try to move in a direction to to get more inclusivity with them. Um, uh, because when you look at all the people that were members there uh, that had uh, been, were featured on the website, there was a real opportunity there. Um, we didn't uh, get as much headway into that at the time that I was involved with them. Um, and hopefully that's changed, I, I really don't, don't know. But uh, yes, more, more work needs to be done and that article that um, I uh, was featured about me in Bay Nature, it talks about the prize and then the real prize. And the prize is, is getting uh, in touch with uh, kids at an early age and, and getting them interested in nature. But the real prize is getting them to make the decision to go to college and study this. That's the real prize, because the more opportunities and chances that we can give people of color to to make that that conscious choice. Hey, I'd like to go to college and be a biologist, study wolves and live in Alaska. I mean, I mean, to have it that specific and that 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 uh, uh, just that focus that, you know, that this is what you're going to do, like I did. It, if we can replicate that again and again and again, now we have more and more opportunities and we have more people to choose from to fill these positions in these organizations, in these agencies and so forth. And so we have to create the opportunity first um, in order to have the opportunity to um, move into those or organizations like you kind of talked about. Thank you for that. Um... I'm just gonna, I just, this was amazing. My last question is very simple because <laughs> yes. this is something I'm giving more of my energy to um, as time goes on and, you know, conserving my energy and preserving it um, for good things in life. What is bringing you joy right now? Ah, what is bringing me joy? Well, it's, uh, I celebrate every day on this planet. I, I enjoy watching, um, the birds as they move about in the forest. I try to get out every day, even if it's just a walk around my neighborhood. I'm looking at the egrets flying over, wondering where's the next rookery that they're flying to. I'm looking at the um, uh, raptors who are flying over. Every now and then I'll see a bald eagle coming by and I know that they're uh, attempting to recolonize on one of our local areas. So it, it's just, it's just that constant being in touch with nature and the outdoors um, gives me a lot of inspiration.
So, and, and of course, hearing the bird songs. I love bird songs and I always love a good challenge when I hear a bird song that causes me to say, hmm, I wonder what that one is and I'll go and study it and then I'll recognize it again in the uh, future. Awesome, thank you so much. This has been a real treat. I am so, so very excited uh, yeah. to just continue getting people connected to bird watching, um, birding. It's 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 an amazing um, opportunity to uh, mm -hmm. engage, re-engage with nature, and you've you've opened that world up even more uh, for us, um, the viewers as well. And I I thank you so much for that. And uh, Taiki, if you wanted to add anything, I don't want to. No man, my I'm gonna <laughs> give that a verbal retweet because that's that's best said. Thank you so much for that, Nicole. And great job moderating. Great job with the questions. Uh, really happy that I got to do this with you. Um, okay. And for a little more context, I <laughs> knew Nicole as like one of the few black birders I knew on Facebook. And then she was going to Philly for the uh, PGM One conference. And when they went to Fairmount Park to watch the birds. I think we were the only two people with binoculars, <laughs> but you know, it was, it was a great birding experience. Wasn't Brie, so. wasn't Brie with us or no? Wimberly? Yeah, I think so. Was Brie was? Okay. Cause I remember the tanager, the scarlet tanager and I, we freaked out while we were doing oh, this. Oh, 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 you mean, I know who you're talking about. You mean uh, Brie underscore ranger. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. That was that was such a fun experience, and then you you took me to the Discovery um, Center, and we got to hang mm -hmm. out there too. So that was really fun. But yeah, let's let's wrap this bad boy. <laughs> let's put a bad let's put a bow in this bad boy. All right. Thank I you wrote... again so much, John. We appreciate you. Yeah, I appreciate it. And, being and a part John, of could it. you tell us where we could find your book? Um, again, yes, uh, you can go to Amazon. It's um, when you're on Amazon, you can get the Birding for Everyone book. At, at amazon.com just uh, search for the title birding for everyone there's a paperback version and there's a kindle version if you're so inclined wonderful thank you again so much and thanks to everybody uh who, who joined in and uh sent in your questions all right thank you everybody and again thank you nicole you did a great job thank you for your time john i'm really glad we got to do this Hopefully we can go birding soon. That would be amazing. Absolutely. <laughs> We'd love to join you. Have a good night, everyone. Good night.